First Timothy chapter 4. Uh, please remember to pray for a lot of different things going on this week. In service starts tomorrow. Amen? All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. I'm excited for the school year. I was talking to Brother Edmonds. He's excited as well. Uh, but also tomorrow, Brother uh, Owen has a procedure uh, tomorrow, so pray for him. And then on the 28th, don't forget to pray for Miss Maud as she has her surgery uh, or her procedure. So lots of uh, prayer needed in the next couple of weeks. Amen. First Timothy chapter 4. It's been a little bit since we've been in First Timothy. I've been traveling quite a bit this summer in and out all over. Uh, praise the Lord for us getting back to some normalcy. So just, just to kind of help us, I'm going to set the tone by giving us a reminder of what's happening 1 Timothy is one of what we call the pastoral epistles, the Apostle Paul writing to a young man in the faith named Timothy. Timothy is left in Ephesus, and he is left as the pastor to preach the Word of God. We see back in 1 Timothy chapter 1 in verse number 3. And he's left with a very diligent purpose. He was to stand against the false doctrine that was in Ephesus and was threatening to enter into the church of Christ in Ephesus. He was also instructed not to get pulled in to the foolish dis debates and discussion that uh, many of the quote-unquote intellectuals enjoyed having because those create gr greater questions rather opposed to having a doctrine that builds strong theological Christians, disciples who are grounded in the doctrines of the Word of God. Paul summarizes those false teachers in 1 Timothy 1 7 by saying, They desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. What, what that means is they don't know what the Word of God actually says nor do they understand the application of what the Word of God is instructing them to do. And so from that point forward, verse number 7 of chapter 1, Paul spends time building Timothy, directing him to be the man of God and to take the preaching of the Word of God seriously. But he also told Timothy that he needed to train preachers, train teachers, to train deacons to be active members of that local church. And he gave them chapter 3, which gives us the biblical qualifications of those men and women of God. But before giving those qualifications, I love what Paul does here. In chapter 1, Paul reminds us of who he is. Do you know that Paul had a past? And that past wasn't a past that he was very proud of. Paul says, Timothy, God can overcome the past of men. God can overcome your past failures, and he can call you into a victorious service. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verses 12 and 13, I thank the Lord Jesus, or, or Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul says, listen, this is Christ who has enabled me. This isn't, I, I'm not talented. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the abilities. But it's God who's enabled me, Timothy. And he says, Timothy, let me remind you of who I was. Who was before. This is who I was in my past. He says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He says, Timothy, I was the worst of the worst. Paul, in this same chapter one, calls himself the chiefest of sinners. He sees himself as being the most prolific of sinners. And a lot of times I talk to young men and they look at their lives and they see their past and they see the foolishness of their past. They see the failures of the past. They see the sins of their past and they let that be a shackle of anger, uh, an anchor that keeps them from moving forward in their service for God. Paul had a past. 
And Paul said this to finish out verse 13, but I obtained mercy. You know, Paul didn't deserve to be forgiven. Paul didn't deserve to be called. Paul deserved what we all deserve, judgment. But he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. It was, yes, I had a past, and, 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 but, but, but guess what? We all have a past. Paul was a, a murderer. He was injurious. He was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. He was sinful. And Paul obtained mercy. And young man, young woman in here who God might be working on in ministry, you might look at your life now and say, I think God's working on me. God's calling me. But I, I have a past. God can overcome your past. <clears throat> and, and the reality is we are saved. We are redeemed to be new creatures in the work of the ministry. And this should cause believers to be more dependent upon Christ than ever before. And God desires to use the most surrendered people, not necessarily the most talented people. And quite often, the most talented people are the people who are gonna fall into the false doctrines because they're relying on themselves and their talents instead of God's power and mercy working in their life. Paul continued with this train of thought through chapter four. In chapter three, I mentioned he gives these qualifications and he tells uh, Timothy that there is going to be a group in chapter four that reject God's word and begin preaching heresy. And he warns Timothy of these heretics and these false messages that they Preach. Let's go ahead and look at chapter 4 in verse number 1. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. And what that means is that the, the Spirit is speaking deliberately. He is very pointed in this statement that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's some pretty strong language here. What he's saying is that in the latter times, that would be in this period of time that we're living in now, up until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. This would be the latter times, the, the, the age of grace and the, age, uh, the period of time of the church age. This is where we are in this latter time. He says, during this period of time, there's going to be a lot of preaching. There's going to be a lot of teaching. There's going to be a lot of churches being established. But there's also going to be a lot of false preaching that comes. And he calls them this. People are going to depart from the truth, from the faith, giving heed to something. What? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. These individuals who have been deceived will speak these lies with a, hypo, a hypocritical mentality, having seared their conscience with a hot iron, forbidding to be married and commanding to abstain from meats. They're going to cast off God's natural ordained laws, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. He says in verse four, or every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So this evening, very quickly, won't spend a tremendous amount of time, at least I don't think I will, looking at 1 Timothy chapter four, the doctrines of devils. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for your goodness. We're thankful for your mercy, and we pray now, God, that you would help us just to give ear to the word of God. And Father, as we, we read this passage of scripture, it, it, is, it is strong language. But Father, you take your church very seriously. You gave yourself for your church. And Lord, I pray that as we examine these words and these truths together, Father, you would stir our hearts to be directed towards you, that you would be exalted, and that you would be honored. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Exposing their departure from the faith. 
exposing the departure from the faith. Let me ask you a question. How do people depart things? How do people end up getting pulled from one thing into another? Well, they have to give heed to it. That word to give heed to means to apply oneself to, to attach oneself to, to hold or to cleave to. I'll give you an example of this. In, in our church this, this evening, we've got Brother, Brother Greg. Brother Greg has given heed to being an Ohio State fan. Brother Combs says, this, I know, I know. How did he get pulled into that? How did he get deceived and pulled into that? Well, he probably were around a whole bunch of deceivers <laughs> that said Ohio State is a school you should root for, right? Now, we, we listen to that, and even Brother Luke's out there chuckling a little bit. We listen to that, and we can have fun with that, but that's the reality. How do we get pulled into anything? Well, we, we give heed to it. And even though people may be resistant in the beginning, some folks, when they give heed, means they relent and they release themselves and, and the, with, the withstanding and they jump into. And Paul is saying there are people who have given heed, who have attached themselves to these teachings that are false. They depart, they depart from good teaching to bad teaching, false teaching. And one of the most frustrating aspects that we read here is that we see they depart from the gospel. Because Romans tells us that Paul said, I am not what? Ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Paul was not ashamed of how he trusted in Christ. He was not ashamed of the work that Jesus did. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, he gives us a definition of what the gospel is. He says, I declare unto you the gospel. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're going to come back here uh, to 1 Timothy. But turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse number one, Paul begins writing to the church at Corinth concerning the resurrection, but he starts off in verse number one by saying, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, you've got to remember, during this period of time, there were people who were perverting the gospel. There were people who were giving heed to the perversions. And so Paul wants them to have an authentic gospel that he preached to them that they could look at and say, this is the gospel we need to be preaching. This is the gospel we need to be, we need to be reminding folks of. He says, listen, I, I've preached it unto you, but it's also the gospel which you've received and in which you stand. He says, by which also ye are saved. See, the gospel is very important, isn't it? You're saved by this gospel. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. He's saying, listen, some of you have changed this. And you're not preaching the gospel any longer. You're preaching something else. He says, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul says, I also received the gospel. That's how Paul became the man of God. He is it's through the preaching of the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So if we're going to look at the gospel, a true gospel, it's got to have Jesus Christ. See, this is important. Because there are a lot of religions in the world that have Jesus Christ, but they don't have the right Christ. Right. You go to the Mormons and ask them, who is Jesus Christ? They'll say, well, he is one of thousands of spiritual children of Elohim. And he and Lucifer were brothers. And they brought a plan of salvation for all of the spirit children that were populated here on the earth. 
And Jesus presented a better salvation plan, so Elohim chose his salvation plan and and rejected Satan. Satan got mad, and the elders that were in heaven that sided with him came, and they're the demon, the demonic spirits. You see how foolish that Jesus is. It's not biblical. That Jesus can't save anyone. And if you have that Jesus a part of your gospel, guess what? You can't be Say, because look what he says. He he says, I declare unto you the gospel, and he speaks through that, and he says, for I deliver first of all that which I also received, how that Christ. See, the gospel is all dependent on Jesus Christ. And so we go to John, we're going to come back here too, so put here, go to John chapter 1. We got to figure out who Jesus is. Well, John chapter 1 tells us who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse number 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and in truth. So the Jesus of the Bible is God. We believe the Bible teaches very deliberately in what we call a triune God, where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit exist equally as God. Now, God the Father is not God the Son, And God the Son is not God the Spirit. They exist in distinct persons, yet they maintain their Godhead as one God. And you say, Pastor, I don't understand it. We don't have to. We just simply have to believe it because that's what the Bible declares. This is the Jesus that is eternally existing who, according to Philippians chapter 2, took upon him the form of a servant and was found in the fashion of a man. That's the Jesus Christ who the gospel is built off of. And so when we look at the 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verse number uh, 3, how that Christ, it has to be the right Christ, How Christ did what? Died for our sins according to the scripture. And the Bible tells us what this means. We could go to Hebrews. We could could go to Isaiah 53. We could go all throughout the the Old Testament and we could look and see what this means. How he is bruised for our iniquities. How he is the eternal sacrifice one time offered for all mankind. And so when we say that Christ died for our sins, he is the propitiation for the entirety of the world. All sin, sinners are sinners. Jesus came and he appeased the wrath of God the Father on the cross with his sacrifice. When he took all of our sin upon him. And he died for our sins according to the scriptures and fulfilling the word of God and that he was buried taking all of man's sin the wickedness and the vileness of the sin nature inherited from Adam and buried in the tomb to plague man no more because The third aspect says, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. See, this is the gospel. Any variation from this is a departure from the gospel. And so that means, brother, do you want to be saved? Say this prayer with me, one, two, three, and not preaching the true gospel leads to what? Somebody saying... Statements. Adding anything else to it removes the power of the gospel. Which becomes another gospel. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11.
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look with me at verse, verse 3. Brother Tyler gave me a new Bible I'm using today. It's very large print, very large print, but the, the pages are sticking together. I should have gone through and broke them up here. Verse 11, 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse number four, for if he that cometh preacheth another, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with it. He says, listen, there is another gospel. And another gospel means it comes with another Christ. And it comes with another spirit. And it comes with another result. Because if it doesn't start with Christ, the result isn't going to be Christ. And that other gospel is accursed. Galatians 1. Galatians 1. Verse number 9. As we said before, so say I now again. Paul's very deliberate here. I want you to see that Paul is not careful in making this declaration. He is not worried about offending anyone. Because this is the, this is the gospel. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received. Remember, we're talking about that death, Christ, the right Christ, Death, burial, and resurrection, all according to the scripture, it's not the gospel of Christ. It is another gospel. Let him be what? Accursed. Let him be accursed. See, folks, this is where we're, we're trying to see here what in the world is going on in the world's churches today. Another gospel. Another gospel. It is not the gospel of Christ. It sounds like the gospel of Christ. It kind of looks like the gospel of Christ. But it is not the gospel of Christ. Put it like this. Suppose I got with Brother Aiden. I said, hey, Brother Aiden, I want you to meet me at Mama Roma's on, let's say, Wednesday afternoon for lunch. And he says, okay. I says, you'll see me. I'll be sitting at a table. And he says, all right. And I said, I'm going to cover the cost of everything. Don't worry. You just come and, and bring your appetite. And when he gets there, he walks into Mama Roma's, and he looks over, and he sees a booth. And at the booth is a, it used to be 5'11", but according to the doctor, I've shrunk, let's say, about almost an inch and a quarter, okay? So anyway, I'm not going to get too far into that. I don't believe the doctor, but let's say you see that sized cutout of me standing by a booth going like this. And you walk in and you see that and you think, that's really weird. And he comes over and he thinks, well, I guess pastor's really making fanfare of this. Look, he went and got a cutout of himself. That's really weird. <laughs> and he sits down because he's just as weird as I am. And so he sits down and an hour and a half goes by and all of a sudden some food comes over and just gets delivered. And he begins eating that food. And another hour goes by and he's looking at his watch. He's like, I got to get back to work. Did we have lunch together? It kind of looked like me. It's about 15 years younger and, you know, 35 pounds lighter, but still, kind of looked like me. It was a, sort of a representation. And I forgot to tell you, um, it had money that I had printed out as well to pay for the food. And he took that up to try to use it. And is that going to work? So in the end, he had to pay for his own meal. 
because that was a fake representation of me. And that's what the world churches are presenting today, a gospel that tries to keep some of the same elements but is false. And it can't pay for your sins. So this is what Paul is warning Timothy in chapter 4. He says they're going to be departing from the gospel. Why? Because there are going to be what he calls seducing spirits. Look with me back over to chapter 4, verse number 1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, which we already established, is this period of time, some shall depart. Aren't you thankful not all will depart? But some will depart. Giving heed. Giving heed to what? Seducing spirits. The word seducing means enticing from the path of virtue or chastity. He's saying here is there is going to be a period of time in which people will stand up and they will speak very eloquent words. And they are going to throw out theological terms. They are going to try to be relevant. They are going to try to speak to where you are. And they are going to sound really good. And people will give heed to that. But what they are is seducing spirits. They're Telling people what they want to hear. Turn with me over to Genesis chapter 3. This is where we first get introduced to seducing spirits. Genesis chapter 3. Brother, I like this Bible. I just got to get these pages to work right. There we go. All right. Verse number one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, do you think that might be appealing? You're, you're going to be like God. You're going to know something. You, there are some things you don't know right now. There are some things you don't have. God is keeping something from you. But if you do this, your eyes will be open. You'll be woke. And you will be like God. Now look what, he, look what, what happens. She hears this in verse number six. And when the woman saw, remember she, he said, your eyes will be open. Verse number six was the first thing that happens. She sees. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They weren't any better off. What did they do? They gave heed to something. There was a choice, as there always is. There was a choice of trusting God, trusting his word, trusting his goodness and mercy and love for you, his righteousness and his plan and his path. And on the other side, there was trusting a serpent who came with words of intrigue, of mystery, something new. And in that, there is this choice to what Eve was going to do. Trust God or give heed to the seducing of the serpent. And how does this take place? The first thing we see in verses one through three, there's the suggestion of a different path 
than what God has ordered. See, the, the seduction is always very fascinating. When, when Satan comes to Jesus in, in, in uh, the wilderness, you notice that he tempts Jesus, he tries to seduce Jesus in an area that would be appealing to Jesus. You're going 40 days and 40 nights without eating. Turn the rock to bread already. So there is an opening already, a desire for it. So the way this seducing happens is suggest a different path that is appealing. And this is where we find ourselves in the world today. You know, I don't think anyone is excited about the fact that there are people who are dying and going to hell. Matter of fact, it overwhelms me sometimes as I think about that truth. And if we're not careful, it can be very appealing to say, you know, hell's just, it, there, it's, a, it's a, a fairy tale that was established to try to scare people into being good. Because that's what some folks say. But here's the reality. Jesus spoke on what? Hell. He taught on it. He declared that it was real. The Bible is full of this aspect and teaching that to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ for believers. However, Whosoever's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life is cast into the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. The reality is, you know, that is not a pleasant thought even for believers to think about that there will be millions and billions of people in hell. It's not pleasant. And so people who don't want to think about that thought open themselves up to the seduction of what? That hell's not real. You see, the seducing suggests a different path than God that is interesting and appeals to us already. Secondly, it appeals to reason and desire over faith. Look at, look at verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. There are no consequences for your actions. Don't we live in a world today where we've removed the consequences? Do what you want. Do what makes you feel good. What is it? You do you, you live your truth. And you know, we ex I expect that from the world. I didn't expect to hear that from places that call themselves the church. From preachers who will stand up, who are given the, the, the responsibility of warning a world of punishment and judgment but also of the graciousness and mercy of our God. And what we have are people who have removed and given in to the seducing aspect through the appeal of reason and desire. And it always promises a better end than God's word promises. That's what the seducing does. In verse 5, for God doth know in the day that thou eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What a promise. You know what? The reality is, it was true. But it came with what? A lot of, all of Satan's apples have worms. And all of his promises shrivel with poison. Eve was seduced, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 14. And these seducing spirits today are found in God's churches. Vance Havner said this, the devil is not fighting religion. He is too smart for that. He is producing a counterfeit Christianity so much like the real one that good Christians are afraid to speak out against it. We are plainly told in Scripture 
that in the last days men will not endure sound doctrine and will depart from the faith and heap to themselves teachers to tickle their ears. We live in an epidemic of it, of this itch. And popular preachers have developed ear tickling into a fine art. This is how the seducing spirits seduce today through preachers. Dynamic men who have great skill in speaking. The internet is full of them, by the way. Seducing away from biblical orthodoxy by using psychological reasoning that seems spiritual. Introducing a false Jesus, creating false gospels. Music. Seducing spirits today, all over in music. Emotional, impactful music that manipulates the hearer into a false sense of praise. Turning the praise of God into the praise of oneself. Appealing to the flesh, doctrinally corrupt, the style of carnal desires. It's also found in churches. Churches that are more carnal than spiritual. One pastor of a large megachurch recently responded on his elaborate ministry while his churchgoers struggle in the modern economy. He said this, well, that's my whole thing. I say to people, do you want me to be a poverty minister? What kind of message does that send? That God doesn't want you to be blessed, but he wants you to go down? That's how he defends his elaborate lifestyle and ministry. This seducing spirit says, listen, God wants you to be rich. Look at me. You can be just like me. I'm rich. And if you give me your money, God will bless you so you can be rich too. And unfortunately, people buy into this. You know why? The seducing spirit that you will be rich too. So the prosperity gospel that is out there is seducing so many people. I don't know if you recall, but, but we had um, one of our brothers here to Africa who was giving us a visual representation of their ministry. And they told a story about how the pastor told them that if they would go out and eat grass, that they would be rich. And he had a picture of people out there grabbing the grass and putting it in their mouth because they believed that they would be rich by eating the grass. This, this is the seduction that is out there where people are buying into these false gospels. That's the spirit of Antichrist in the world today. And lastly, this evening, departing for the doctrine of devils. I don't have time to go into all of the depths of this, but in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, we begin to see what the doctrine of the devils is by, by examining the fall of Lucifer. There are five I will statements that sum up his his desire of pride and arrogance. And the modern church has adopted this prideful mentality. There's a reinterpretation of scripture that they moved away from a reliable, preserved, perfect, inerrant word of God. And we believe the King James Bible to be exactly that, the perfectly preserved Bible for English-speaking people. I have confidence that it's God's word, that God can believe what God says. But in the intellectual world today, they tell you, well, you can't be certain anything is the word of God. A reinterpretation of orthodox understanding. There was a point in time that people believed the Bible, and when they read Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11, they just believed what the Bible said. They believed the creation account. Unfortunately, that's not the case today. One Christian apologist who is very well known in Christian intellectual realms denies the creation account in favor of billions of years in evolution. And when he was 
question on this. He said, well, I just believe the science. So what does that say? If he just believes the science, what doesn't he believe? The Bible. And if we're not going to believe that portion of the Bible, what portions of the Bible are we going to believe? He denied the interaction between Eve and the serpent. And when asked on why he did that, he said, come on, serpents can't speak. That's foolish. And so he affirms that the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis must be looked at in an allegorical manner, not literal. See, that's departing after the doctrines of devil. Doubt to the word of God. I can determine what the word of God is. I will, deter I will determine who God is based on what I want the Bible to say. See, this is where, where we, we differ I believe the Bible and try to make my life line up with the Bible as the Holy Spirit of God convicts me of understanding and truth and illuminates me to his word. And you know, we look at the world today and there's a deviation from these things. Church, I want to encourage you, get back to the Bible. Get back to the basics of studying the word of God. I am thankful for YouTube and books and all those things too. I really am. But I want to warn you, there is so much seduction out there. And most people aren't mature enough to be able to discern what is truth and what is not. And so when some video gets 100,000 likes, like what videos do you watch? Do you watch the one that has 14 likes? Most of us would say, well, that one can't be any good. It only has 14 likes. But the one that has 100,000 views in four hours, that's got to be good. Seducing spirits. Seducing spirits. So I want to encourage you, get back to your Bible. Right here. Get back into this book. Start reading this. Let this book build you and guide you. Go back to a, an orthodox understanding of the word of God. Or the historical doctrines of, of scripture speak to us and build us and change us to be who God has called us to be. So this evening, as we look at these doctrines of devils, we also see the reality of truth of scripture. Father, I come before you and I thank you so much for your word. I'm thankful that we have the truth. Father, so many of us can get pulled into the left and to the right and there's so much out there. And it's, Father, for so many, it's hard to be able to judge and discern. And so, Father, I pray that you would make it clear to our folks, Father, what the word of God says that you would help us to stay faithful to this book, to the God of this book, to the Savior that is told about in this book, to the Spirit of God that inspired this book and lives and dwells in each believer. Father, now as we get ready to have a time of invitation, I just pray that you would have your way. Their heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask a couple questions. Who would say, Pastor John, I don't know I'm born again. I don't even know I'm saved. I'm really not even sure what that means. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just put your hand?